Hey guys, welcome to session number 41 of the Trailer Music Composers Podcast. Thanks for listening. One man whose favourite guitarist is Billy Corgan from the Special Pumpkins. Welcome to the Trailer Music Composers Podcast. Hey guys, welcome to another session of the Trailer Music Composers podcast. Now I've got a really, really great interview for you today. Uh, It's with a co, uh, an elephant co-composer. His name is Cy Begg. Now, one of the reasons I wanted to get Cy on is not just because of his experience in the music industries, but Cy creates his own instruments which i absolutely love you know um and i have loved that for many 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 years uh, creating instruments is a way to get around the the age-old problem of well i can't play any instruments but i need an organic sound so if you can't play any instruments but need an organic sound make your own instruments and record them or sample them boom bob's your uncle um, or in my case, Bob's my dad. And uh, there you have it. You have interesting sound. Now, Cy, kind of, uh, you should check out his Instagram feed uh, and listen to the work he does for Elephant because he is absolutely smashing it at the moment with his wonderful and weird sounds that he's creating. Uh, the uh, particular highlight for me is the plank bass. Uh, so yeah, I hope you enjoy this. And remember, if you're struggling to get an organic sound, listen to what Sai says and go to your local DIY shop, order some strings or whatever it is, resonating material that you're going to use and make your own instruments. It's a wonderful way to ramp up the sound of your cue. Enjoy chaps. Cy Begg, welcome to the Trailer Music Composers podcast. I am so chuffed to have you, and I'm very excited about getting nerdy, uh, specifically <laughs> about your your um, contact miking of very, very bizarre sounds. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, no, I'm glad to be here. <laughs> so uh, before we start, I do like to start start the the whole questioning questioning sounds a bit scary isn't it? The, <laughs> interrogation the, yeah that's it actually that's it yeah start the interrogation with a a slightly light-hearted question uh, specifically okay. um and i think this i'm very excited about your answer for this one if you were to be an instrument sorry <laughs> which one would it be and why <laughs> and that can include any of your bizarre homemade uh hmm if I was to be an instrument, oh, the possibilities are endless. It's hard to know whether to go with. Um, I think, as my first love is of synthesizers, it probably, even though I love my contact mics, don't be offended, guys. Um, <laughs> it would be probably a, just a nice, maybe a, a Pro One, a Sequential Circuits Pro One. Lots of bottom end and a bit gnarly around the edges and a few surprises. For a, for a basic monosynth. That's me all over. <laughs> I like that. So how do you describe yourself, Si? Well, lots of bottom end. Uh... <laughs> and a few surprises. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Well, that's awesome. Um, okay, so for those in the audience who don't know you, why, yep. why don't you introduce yourself, um, you know, and what you do and what you have done, how mm-hmm. you got to where you are now? Um, <clears throat> well, oh. My name is Cy Begg, and I suppose I started out right at the beginning. Well, I've always I've always loved music, and as a kid, I played in bands and played the guitar and played a bit of the drums, and I got more and more as a guitarist into effects pedals, and I started buying more and more effects pedals, and then got a four track, and then realised I was more interested in the pedals than the guitar, so drifted into cheap synths discovered like early cabaret voltaire and things like that because in those days synths were so expensive you you know you saw those pictures of amazing modular setups and all that kind of thing there's no way i'm gonna be able to afford that but then when you heard heard stuff like cabaret voltaire you thought i I could do this at home with a four track and you know a few effects pedals so i got more and more into the electronic stuff uh then the kind of dance music explosion happened and i sensed oh, actually, that there might be a market for strange electronic music as long as there's a repetitive beat <laughs> underneath it. And started getting into that, did a lot of techno stuff, electro, always on the kind of more wonky 
weird side, but also I was doing uh, kind of breakbeat stuff, people like Ninja Tune. Um, and I think at some point, because I, I was DJing a lot, but then at some point I, did, I, I started to get more interest in sync stuff. So I'd, I'd always loved film music, but had no idea how that was ever going to happen. And then through a friend who was a graphic designer, I started doing audio for his motion graphics. He was in like MTV logos and stuff like that. So I started, that was my kind of introduction into music to picture. And then from there, I started working for a, a few ad agencies, uh, people like Adele Foy and doing bespoke stuff for uh, ads. And then just kind of built it up from there and just decided, yeah, this is really what I'm interested in. I, I love DJing, I love clubs, all that kind of thing. But it wasn't really entirely what I was about and that's been my kind of mission for the last 20 years I suppose to try and get into scoring and that kind of world with trailers film tv anything that's about the long and short of it I suppose well okay um I want to dive into a couple of things there specifically you mentioned about bespoke work for ads obviously Mm -hmm. this is about trailer music but at the end of the day this is advertising that we work in still so you're talking more about product advertising over yeah films yeah and that yeah because at the time there was um well it seemed to me at the time there was there was a lot of people like the company i was working for adele for at the time they had in-house composers who would just do everything and they were brilliant but they would cover so many different styles and the reason adele Foy liked me is because i was doing electronic stuff and it was authentic it sounded like the real deal so at that point you had especially a lot of the more urban brands like nike wanted authentic sounding uh electronic kind of urban stuff um a lot of the fashion houses especially in europe wanted you know good quality kind of deep house and techno kind of stuff that sounded like it was the real thing not someone doing their imitation of it with a few loops or whatever so that that's how i kind of got into it but it's yeah it's very restrictive i'd say even more it's different to trailers because trailers as you know it's more the music comes first and you hope someone will use it whereas this well, I mean, apart from the custom ones, but all the ad stuff is so specific. They normally, you know, already have a track in mind that they want but can't afford. And they say, just rip that off, but without sounding like you ripped it off. So I, I, I don't know. It's, it, there were some great jobs, but I, I find there's more freedom in the trader world, certainly, which is why it's more appealing for me. Yeah, well, you can you can get a lot weirder with trailer stuff. Uh, yes. <laughs> but but the, yeah yeah anyway, I I uh, had a similar journey to you started off in advertising as well. Um, mm. So yeah, I completely get what you're what you're saying about that. Um, and yeah. I think there's no surprise both of us had landed uh, both feet firmly in trailer music. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, have, I mean, you know, there were some great jobs along the way. Every now and then you get these dream briefs. But yeah, sometimes it's and also the world of you know oh, it's just the world of advertising is pretty bonkers. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So I'm. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I, I still dabble and I still do some kind of um, interesting kind of some live event type music and things like that and other things. But yeah, trailers I, I'm more enjoying, definitely. So let's dive into uh, your trailer work. Um, so obviously we've kind of both of us work with Vic at Elephant and we have done since its formation and prior. Um, yeah. So tell the audience a little bit about what uh what trailers you've landed and uh and what styles what what what's the sound that you're you've you are landing generally i remember when i first started with vikram it was um my thing was very much in the more i suppose what would be termed the sound design type trailers so the first ones i did were very electronic very uh kind of high octane uh quite abstract no discernible kind of strings or brass or anything like that just very kind of pounding so I think that's what he was interesting so he knew I had that techno background so he was like can you get all those cool noises but into a trailer structure and it did take quite a long time for me to get my head around uh, you know how to make something useful for a trailer you know I, I was making what I thought were pretty cool piece of music but they just weren't trailer friendly so that that's what took time to get that kind of formula to understand the structure and how it needs to work. So I, mean, I remember the first, I can still remember that. I think the first one I got was a Jason Bourne uh, TV spot 
Spanish <laughs> TV spot Jason Bourne. But I remember being, yeah, absolutely delighted. It was, it was the best thing when you, when you get your first one. It's like, yes. Because I think once I got one, because I always thought, oh, is my stuff right for trailers? But once you got one, you think, well, if they liked it, then someone else is going to like it. So that's all good. You know, we're off. Uh, and in fact, that same track got used again years later for the Blade Runner 2049 um, TV spot as well. So that, that's been quite a winner, that one. And that was a pretty, yeah, heavy electronic one. But s- since then, yeah, I've I've got more into the organic side of it. Because I think, well, I think the whole sound design thing, maybe th- there was a fashion for it that kind of went a bit. And more recently, I've got more into the darker side of thrillers drama and full-on kind of horror stuff so that's been my main zone which is how I got into doing all the weird bespoke noises because I I think I was searching for good sound libraries of you know really scratchy nasty strings and horribly mangled cellos I thought well maybe I'd just get some bits of you know some I bought a set of double bass strings got a plank of wood and stretched them out and put some contact mics on and got a bow and thought oh this is all right. <laughs> yeah, it sounds great. Uh, so it literally was one of those things out of necessity, really, that I couldn't find the sounds that I wanted uh, that got me into it. And then, yeah, and that's led me to be more and more of that kind of horror world, I suppose. Or, as I say, dark thrillers, dark dramas, but definitely the more weird, dark side of stuff. So, I mean, it kind of sounds like, actually, it's kind of like the beautiful marriage of your kind of interest in film score but also your interest in deconstructing sound and synthesis and things. Yes, yeah. Um, I definitely, I I do listen to a lot of trailers, but often what inspires me the most is, yeah, my favourite scores of the moment, interesting scores that I've heard, and I try and take that and get that into a a trailer world. Um, And it is very much for me about the sound and, you know, just sometimes you hear those amazing signature sounds that you're just like, whoa. Where did that sound come from? That's incredible. You don't even know what created it or where it came from. It's like, woof. So it is, yeah, it's very much about the sound for me. That, I think that is my forte. I love beautiful melodies and all that kind of thing, but I don't think it's so much my strong point. There's people that do that far better than me, so I'll stick to the noise. <laughs> yeah, well, the thing is, I, I mean, I'm always saying to the audience that they should be sticking to what they enjoy the most because... Mm-hmm. Uh, I, it seems for both you and I, the moment we focused on the things we enjoyed was the moment all of a sudden everything blew up. Uh, yes. Sp- especially yeah. in trailers. Because as you're right, actually, the hardest job when you first start getting trailer stuff is understanding the structure and yes. nailing it. Yeah, and it seems so simple once you've kind of got your head around it, but it took me a long time to really understand what editors were looking for. And Vic, yeah, would very patiently <laughs> explained it over and over again. I was thinking, what, why did he get it? And it's like, oh, right, now I get it. You know, but it does, it takes a while. And then, um, and it's that weird thing that although there is a relatively st- almost strict formula to the way trailers are, tend to be organised, the music it trays, it's, there's, there's so much freedom within that. It's just like, yeah, okay, this is, this is your basis, but beyond, but then you've got so much freedom, really. And sometimes you need some rules or else you know, where to begin. It's like, at least you have in your head, right, I know what the structure has to be roughly. Now let's see, let's go crazy within that, you know. So, <laughs> <laughs> so what, what advice would you give to anyone who's still struggling with the trailer structure? Uh, I don't know, really. I suppose listen to a lot of trailers um, and listen to also a lot of trailer, successful trailer albums to hear how the tracks... Because that, I think that was what was always confusing is that you listen to a trailer... But that's not how the, the editor won't will have edited that and mucked about with it and done all sorts of things. So you have to listen to how the track sounded originally. And that's what interested me when I first started, like Vic would say, oh, check out this trailer. It's really cool. And then I would find the original track and then say, right. So that was how it was, this two minute piece that got cut down to this 30 second edit. And, and then you start to kind of, yeah, get your head around what what's what's useful i suppose what where what's kind of practically useful for an editor things like they don't want you know i would often put in lots of little fiddly bits and lots of little changes or you know there might be a key change or something that it's like no no they you know they, they want to be able to chop bits from the end that's still going to match with bits in the middle that might match with bits from the beginning and it's all got to be it's thinking of it, i think when i start to think of it more as 
you're not presenting a finished piece of music you're preventing pre- presenting a kind of a kit something to work with like a nice range of sounds that are all going to go together however you chop them up and lots of nice layers and bits and bobs they can muck about with and yeah but as, as i say there's no half time there's no silver bullets it's because sometimes there's tracks that don't conform to all the rules that sometimes suddenly do really well so you never know <laughs> yeah i th- i think that's often when like you can hear them hear it in the tracks i think when they haven't necessarily conformed but there's something special about them mm. uh, and I, I and i think that's you know that's when that composer is is in their zone you know that's when they're doing, yeah. doing what they really love it's, it's what yeah. you're saying about signature sounds I I just love hearing different signature sounds, and there aren't enough mm. of them, uh, you know, because it, people get a bit scared when you talk about signature sounds. But yes, actually, it's just kind of like mucking about with effects, really, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and yeah, just following your nose, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. And then, you, and then when you find one, it's like, oh yeah, that's a cool sound. Mm. And sometimes I've I've done tracks where I think it's nearly finished, then right near the end. I find a sound that just happens once right at the end. I don't think, oh, that's a really cool sound. <laughs> that needs to happen throughout the whole thing. <laughs> and then you go back and drop it in everywhere. Uh, so you never know when you're going to find that sound. When you do, it's like, oh, yes, I need more of this. Yeah, yeah. I think that's that's the really, the, I think the thing that I've noticed a lot of people when they're trying to figure out the trailer structure, uh, they don't realise how much space trailer music really needs. Yes. Yeah, that's another thing I used to do is try and pack it out early on rather than realising, yeah, just, yeah, less is more. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, that this is this is the kind of realisation, like, looking back on, so, you know, you've got you've got kind of a hindsight of your career, looking back, you go, oh, these are the ones that landed, and it's because of this, and you know, yes. the, the similarity yes. is so often, yes, the structure was kind of right, but actually a lot of my tracks that have landed a lot don't have a third mm-hmm. act, strictly. Oh, they, really? They just have an act one and one massive building act two. Uh, and nice. if they do have a third act, it's like 10 seconds long and it's like just noise. <laughs> <laughs> it's just noise. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, it's interesting. But it's, I find I find the third act the most painful bits to do for some reason. Love my intros. I, I, I'd love to just make intros all day, frankly. <laughs> Just moody intros. Yeah. High five. It's, yeah, yeah. it's those damn third acts. Uh, but often they're the bits when you actually watch the trailer that are the most exciting and the most exhilarating. And, you know, everyone loves a big third act. It's it's really interesting with, with third acts, um, you know, the, the, the back end everyone talks about. Because when you're dealing with something like orchestral or hybrid orchestral stuff, the third mm. act, you kind of go, OK, I need the entire orchestra. I need some synths. And and they basically need to be playing the same chords, yeah. You know, yeah, doing yeah. the same melody because they don't want bang, com- bang, bang. yeah, exactly. Bang, bang, bang. It's it's very like it's kind of it's laid out for you to see, but with yeah. with the other trailer music that people don't talk about because everyone talks about trailer music and everyone thinks oh epic music right yeah 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 but actually trailer music is a huge amount of stuff. Uh, and both you and I uh, dip our toes into the thriller and horror and the, the oh, dark. Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, and there isn't such strict rules for Act 3. Mm, definitely. But as composers, we feel compelled to bring something massive to the table. Yeah, yes, yes. And it is very difficult to uh, to take these weird sounds that you create, This these intimate gritty throaty sounds and then all of a sudden give it this huge scale yes so yeah. how do you do that well that i think that's probably exactly as you're saying what makes why i find them difficult because i hate to lose that those detailed intimate sounds in a wash of and a mess of big rises and massive hits and all the rest of it so yeah, I really try now to find more interesting ways of making that third act exciting, powerful, but without just, like, say, turning everything up to 11 and putting more and more and more and more on top, on top, on top. So sometimes it's about just bringing some of those sounds even f- further forward in the mix, stripping some things back, making sure 
it's more, more about impact. So what sounds you do have jump right out and really hit you hard, but don't. I try not just to layer things up and end up just putting more and more and more on top. But it is, yeah, it can be it can be a real bugger. <laughs> that third act, it can um, indeed. Yeah. So I'm, at the moment, I am. I'm definitely trying to find new ways of like I've, I'm trying again. There's tendency to speed things up to double time to to maybe actually go slower, go half time, go more individual sounds, go. Yeah, just trying to find different ways. But it's got to be exciting, that scene. It's got to bring something new. There's got to be some new energy that, that gives you that peak moment. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. Still learning. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't we all? Uh, yeah. Well, that's, well, that's one of the reasons why I enjoy doing this, because I get to uh, peek into the brains of everyone else. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's how you do it. Interesting. Right. Yeah. Notes. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I'm glad you said the word impact, actually, because... Uh, when I first got into trailers, I was so afraid of the fact that everything needed to be massive mm, because yeah. scale was always the big thing. Give yeah. it scale. Yeah. Give it, you know, make it sound huge. And that would, all, okay, obviously that's Vic's words. It needs to be huge. <laughs> uh, yeah. But, you know, the editors, the supervisors, they all, they wanted it to be sounding big and that always scared me. But as soon as I kind of shifted it to, like you say, having impact, yeah. It, yeah. You suddenly completely reframe the climax of the track. Yeah. So I mean that's the realization I've done with the the throat albums is oh, I don't have to necessarily go massive. I can just do exactly what you say, change the tempo. Yeah. And yeah. change the rhythm at the same time and all of a sudden those sounds that you heard sound fresh because they're in a different setting. Yeah, 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 totally. And yes, it is, like I say, yeah, it's that tendency, I think, everyone thinks of trailers, it's about huge reverbs and huge slams, but it's like, you can just lose everything. Sometimes, if you've got everything all at that level throughout the whole thing, where can you go? So it's about just getting the dynamics right and just realising sometimes it's about just getting the volume levels right can make a huge difference. Just getting the mix right can make a huge difference. Or, yeah, it doesn't have to just be everything cranked to a ridiculous degree so uh you talked about really relishing the detail mm. of the sounds uh now on your instagram feed you you share which i i frequently uh enjoy uh you share little snippets of your strange homemade instruments you've you've got yeah. a, you've told us about your plank double bass or double plank yeah. Ba- yeah. plank bass uh which uh, which I think was was that the one that was used on the horror track the horror tr- horror track on oh I forget which Red Moon no yes it would have been on the Red Moon yeah there was definitely quite a bit of it on the Red Moon yes that, oh yes see you wouldn't think that was a plank <laughs> <laughs> yeah so to tell us let's dive into Cybeg's brain tell us a little bit about the instruments that you've made uh, that have been on tracks that have been placed. Um, well, yes, there's all sorts, really. Sometimes I forget. I was thinking, how did I make that noise? Especially when there's a really good one. I think, what, what was I doing when I did that? Damn, I need to do it again. But most of them have been involving st- wires and strings either being bowed, plucked or struck in various different ways. So either, as I said, the planks, where I've just stretched them out. Um, I've bought some... Uh, kind of machine heads and screw them onto the plank so I can tune them vaguely and tighten them up. Uh, some of them have been just suspended. I've just hung them from uh, hooks on the ceiling and put <laughs> weights on the bottom or even just held them by hand and just bowed them away, uh, mainly with contact mics. I do sometimes mic them up as well. Sometimes I use a combination of the contact mic because sometimes with the contact mics, you do lose um, a lot of the top end sometimes. So often I use a mic like this really close up and layer it up with the contact mic so you get that kind of scrapey the hair the bow that real kind of high-end stuff um and it is it's often the bowing stuff that i've used an awful lot because i like the fact that it's it it puts you in that world of cellos and violins that we know so well from horror soundtracks or from you know all film soundtracks but 
it doesn't sound like a cello or a violin. There's something weird going on, and I, I, I like that kind of zone. So, um, yeah, a lot of that. I'm trying to think which ones have been used. I mean, there's a, one of the, the a feature film I did, Darkness of Otherwhere, that's out in the festivals at the moment. That's probably the most bespoke stuff I've ever done. Pretty much everything on that soundtrack has come from one of these devices with various bits of processing and editing. Because that's the weird thing is that, of course, you've only got one string, so you can only do one at a time. So you have to, often I've layered them up over and over again to get a nice kind of rich sound or panning hard left and right kind of two takes of the same kind of sound. Because you can, yeah, you can only do one note at a time, or one thing at a time. So there's a lot of editing and processing that goes on afterwards, but but pretty much, yeah, they are they're pretty much as I do them. Metal sheets as well, quite a few sheets of metal involved, bowing nice. sheets of metal, and using sheets of metal as almost like a, a real yeah a plate reverb kind of thing. So I've got uh, these little I don't even know what you call them. I think they call the proper term is they just transducer speakers. They're like kind of speakers that actually vibrate little bits of metal and you can stick them on and then use them almost as an effect send so you can send sounds out of the computer vibrating through the sheet of metal and then back in again from a contact mic or sometimes feeding back on itself you can get weird drones feedback making the sheets of metal vibrate ebos all sorts of fun it's endless <laughs> that's awesome i think that reminds me of uh when i was at uni one of the one of my fellow students was obsessed with contact mics and uh up to the room where we had a lot of our lectures there was a one of those lovely sort of 60s concrete staircases oh lovely so all the way along he'd placed contact mics and fed them into a mixing desk with speakers oh. into our uh lecture space and it, it got them it, i don't i don't know i don't even know how he did it but he'd got got it so that it created these beautiful pitched tones it was mm. it was immense. It was really really cool. Oh, it is a lot of fun. I, I sometimes take them. I've got my Zoom uh, portable recorder, and I sometimes take the contact mics out and about, uh, and you get yeah, you come across some sounds you would never expect. I remember the most interesting one I found was when I was on the tube one day, recording various sounds. I just thought, well, I'll put the contact mics on the on the handrail of the escalator, those kind of thick rubber handrails. And all of a sudden there's this insane swooshing, I guess, cause they're rubbing up against things. And it was like this mad kind of yeah, sound, indescribable sound. It's like, my God, I've never known that sound was in there, you know? <laughs> so it's, you do, it's like a hidden world of sound contact mics. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. It's, I, I absolutely love field recording. Uh, mm. I, I have to say, I, I, I I haven't dived into contact miking much uh, yeah. beyond like tiny uh, piezo mics, you know. That yes, you, that you'd get. But well, they can be a lot of fun. They can, but the the the, the noise you get from them uh, uh, and their their frequency yeah. response isn't very good. Uh, so uh, what was it? I mic'd up. I can't. Remember. What was the sh- what, Maplins? They used to. I just. Oh yeah. Just to get on Ma- Maplins, which is uh, for those of you in the audience who don't know what Maplins is, is a uh, I don't know. I don't know whether it was just a UK chain, a chain of like electronic shops where you could buy all sorts of like tiny little electronic equipment, mm. uh, like things like piezo mics and little tiny yeah. light bulbs. It was it was really cool. It was very nerdy. Uh, oh, it was, it was. <laughs> brilliant. Loved Maplins. Yeah, no. they used to. Was it Maplins? I think one of they used there was a synth. They used to make like analog synth kits. Um. Back in the olden days. That would not surprise uh, me. Yeah. But yes, hours of fun. <laughs> As we sigh nostalgically. <sighs> <laughs> yeah. My plans. Uh But yeah, going back to the thing, uh, going, around, going around with a field recorder um, is huge. Because like you say, mm. especially if you have the headphones on at the same time, mm. you suddenly go, "Why this sounds amazing. You know, yeah. fridges sound amazing. Yes. Uh, yes. Like, well, actually, in fact, any, yeah. any, kind of equipment, any kind of equipment with a motor sounds just yes. fantastic. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And, you know... Drones. It, and yeah. T- oh, yeah. Well, and, in fact, part of the reason also I got into contact mics was because I did try originally recording stuff with, with mics. 
because often they were quite quiet because you didn't have the sound box of a, a cello or a guitar or whatever. And because I haven't got a, a kind of a soundproof recording studio of any type, it was really hard to isolate the sound. So I thought, oh, I can use contact mics because then there's no, you know, not have any problems with outside sound. So it was kind of almost unintentional. I, I was really only started using the contact mics to avoid recording my kids screaming in the room next door when I was trying to record stuff. But all of it, and then it just opened up this whole world of like, actually, this is, you know, crazy, the things you can do with contact mics. So, you know, it's interesting. Oh, it's... I mean, I wish that, you know, it's, it's, but it's, it does take up a lot of time. Uh, so, yeah, it's not, that's why I've also been doing some sound library stuff as well, because it's almost like an excuse to record all these sounds. And you can also use them to sell sound libraries as well. So it kind of kills two birds with one stone somewhat. Why is, is that on Splice or something? Um, well, I've done some with uh, Zero G. I've done some stuff with them. Mm -hmm. uh, sample tracks, the guys in Italy, done some stuff with them. So I kind of, yeah, spread it around a bit. Nice. Uh, Sorry, there's just too many questions popping around in my head at the moment. Um, <laughs> I think I, I'd like to revisit the fact that you kind of briefly mentioned that you write feature scores, uh, because there's, oh, yes. there's one film specifically uh, mm -hmm. with Jay, uh, from Jay. Sorry, <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, also, uh, I'd like to dive into uh, your process. So it's one thing to sit there and record weird sounds mm -hmm. it's another thing to take those sounds and turn them into decent pieces of music so say for instance you hung a double bass wire from your ceiling you contact mic'd it up and you also had a mic uh, picking up the bow sounds and you just recorded a few sounds on that what would you do to take that to a complete mm. trailer track uh, which would undoubtedly be in the horror thriller world i presume yes um yeah it's funny because you can end up recording tons of stuff but then you only use a, a tiny bit so it might be that yeah there's just because that is the the nature of this stuff is that it's very unpredictable um and very hard to repeat anything you know you might do one pass of the bow and then do it a second time and it sounds completely different so it might just be just one particular movement you did just caught the wire a particular way to get a really nice sound. And it might be that's just your signature sound. And so you end up just using that one sound. It could be sometimes I will take multiple takes of a similar sound, whether it's a pluck or a short bow. And quite often I love this new thing, the latest version of Logic, the quick sampler, where you can just drag and drop into the instrument channel and it just brings up a sampler instrument with the sound you've drag and dropped and you can do the slice so it slices it along the midi notes so you've got a playable straight away all the different takes are playable on a keyboard it's beautiful and so i might use that to create a rhythm track or a kind of you know something more syncopated or uh, rhythmic and then sometimes once i've got a few sounds uh I might think, ah, oh, what I need now is another pluck or another bow and add some more things on top. Once I've got something, I, I can see what I need. Other times, that's it. That's all I need. I might only use three sounds or something. Uh, and that just gives you your start point and then you jump off from there. But it's it's quite rare. Certainly with the trailer stuff, it's quite rare that normally it would be, I think probably, that, you know, I might use four or five sounds uh, whether they be loops or kind of more signature sounds. And that would be it. I think if you use too many, it just sounds like, yeah, there's a, a fight going on in a factory somewhere. It's just all a bit bizarre <laughs> and weird. Uh, or, and often it is, I think that the three, if there's, I think there's three categories of sounds that I'm making. It's either drones, um, pulsing kind of loops, or kind of, yeah, individual hits or bows or kind of brammy type things. And so, I'm, uh, yeah, I won't use loads. I don't want to overdo it. And I like to have them at the forefront. And they hopefully they'll be a standout sound that make people go, oh, what's that? And then underneath, you'll use more traditional sounds to back it up. Maybe. <laughs> to be fair, that sounds like a, a masterclass condensed into a few minutes. Um, 
Because, uh, yeah, obviously, after the training music school, and Vic and I have protege where we uh, oh, yes. teach people pretty much how to uh, master m- many areas of trailer music and pretty much advertising music. Uh, and one of them is organic sound design. Uh, and what you kind of mentioned is a couple of the mistakes that you hear. Namely, using too many sounds. Because mm-hmm. uh, the temptation is, and I think this, this isn't necessarily just with sound design, but I think when people first get into trailer music, people, they kind of don't appreciate how much space a good sound needs to breathe. Yeah, yeah. You know, if you've got a signature sound, that could carry 15 seconds of your track. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you job know, done. Except why, <laughs> why you say that, but yes, yeah, job done. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's true. If it's good enough. Yeah. And I think that also there's that te- temptation that if a sound isn't good enough, then oh, I need to add something else. So if my if that signature sound isn't exciting enough, I need to put something else underneath it or over it, and you end up with these stacks and stacks of tracks, and it's just electronic soup. That's yeah, it. yeah. As I always think of it. It's just too much. Or like the I can't remember the exact analogy that the fight in the factory. I like that. That sounds yeah. <laughs> <laughs> things clattering and banging about. Yeah, <laughs> but it's yeah. I think again, and that's something that I've learned over the years is is yeah that less is more approach. That if if a sound isn't working. It doesn't need something else on top. It's just not a good enough sound, and you need to throw it away and find something better. Sadly, <laughs> because yeah. or if or if a rhythm isn't you know impactful enough or exciting enough, don't add even more sounds on top. Change the rhythm or change the sounds or fiddle with the production. But rarely does adding more tend to help matters. Yeah, great advice. Um, and I, I think this is as both of us love intros so much. I think. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, you know, in all fairness, most of my placements are from my the first thirty to yes. thirty to sixty seconds of my tracks. Yeah, um, yeah. And I think it's probably this from a similar thing side that both of us like to give those interesting sounds space. Yes, yes. Uh, and definitely. that's what that's what the editors go for. That's what the supervisors go for. They go, oh, that's a cool yes. sound. Oh, that's perfect. Yeah. This because yeah, it, it yeah. create when you have an interesting sound it immediately creates a landscape. You hear mm. you hear the sound but you see a world. Uh, I think that's that's the wonderful exciting thing about walking around with a zoom mic. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah no, definitely. No, it is that yeah, like I said, it is a lot about space. And again, it's that weird thing. Again, that's why you never know quite how your tracks are going to be used because sometimes. Yeah, they'll have stripped half the stuff out and gone down just to one stem or two stems of your original mix. But obviously you couldn't have given them just those two stems because they would probably listen to that and gone, oh, that's that's not very exciting. But, so it's that, yeah, it's that weird thing that although they can end up being very minimal, what an editor uses, if you gave them something that minimal in the first place, they'd probably think, oh, that's too minimal. Or, they, or it's the wrong stem. You can't decide which stem they're going to want more than another one and how much dialogue there is, how much whatever they're going to be using on top. So, yeah, it's a strange business, really. <laughs> strange yet wonderful. It is. It is. I think the nice... Like, I mean, there was one of the best placements that Vic got me was this uh, on the Quiet, Quiet Place 2 trailer, which is an excellent trailer to be on. Um, and I literally had to listen to it three times before I could hear which bit was mine. I had no idea. <laughs> but apparently it was one stem that was throughout the whole thing. Uh, and I did, I, I picked it out in the end, but it took a long time to hear where it was. It's crazy. <laughs> I've had that so many times where you're like, I can't, is this, is this mine? Are you sure? <laughs> Are you really? sure? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to complain, you know. It was, no. Yeah. Um, no. We, and it's interesting, the editors are getting so creative now, you know, they're yeah. really creating songs out of, yeah, multiple stems. It's quite interesting. Well, we had, uh, Vic and I did uh, Throat 2 together, uh, well, it was throat. Two. I did throat two with Vic, and uh, it was one trailer house took multiple tracks, stems from multiple tracks, and cut them all together to score the whole trailer. Wow! From multiple, I think there was about ten tracks on wow. that one trailer. But like Brilliant. a Boam from this one, uh, a cello pulse yeah. from this one, a rise of it was yeah, it was yeah. it was amazing. Like you say, it was so it was so creative. I listened to it and go. 
Well, that sounds like the 11th track I didn't do. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> can, you, can you come in and do that? <laughs> yeah. No, I know. Come in the studio. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. I think it's, yeah, it's wonderful. I just lo- love it. Uh, mm. I'd like to also go back to just one, answer one question for me, please, about your process. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, I hear this a lot with uh, composers who work in the hybrid world when they've obviously got something like, uh, I always forget the name of the company, uh, Tree, Wood, Epic Tree, epic wood. tree uh, Sound Tree. No, uh, everyone listening is going, as this, why are you thinking? <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. I'm, if any of the, anyone from the company is listening, I'm sorry. Uh, I can't remember that. They do like trailer packs and trailer instruments. Right. And they're f- it's filled with these sort of beautiful trailer sh- swish hits that just sound... I'm not Keep Forest. Keep Forest. Thank you. Yes. I knew you. it was something to do with trees. Woods, trees. Yeah. yeah got there. <laughs> uh, and you hear people using like a swish hit. And you go, well, mm-hmm. that's great. That sounded impactful yeah. and wonderful. And then you hear it again four bars later. And then you hear it again four bars later. And you start to hear this. You go, okay, they're just plopping these one shots down. Which yeah. actually is, is a very economical way of writing. And we do this, obviously, with the sounds we record. Yeah. But how do you get over the, f- uh, get over the problem that sometimes when you hear a signature sound or an impactful sound too much all of a sudden people's ears switch off. Mm, It's a tricky one. And as I say, what can be annoying is that quite often, if it's some weird sound that I've created, I can't really go back and make another variation of it because the wires have gone, the contact mics are somewhere else, the whole thing's changed. So, yeah, it's quite tricky. Sometimes I will try, that's what I suppose when processing can come in because then you can try and find some way of just altering the sound a bit so it sounds like it's a different take. It sounds like the same instrument, but you've just changed it a bit. Maybe try some weird, I try sometimes subtle granular type time stretchy things just to change the shape of the sound, the length of the sound, the way it impacts, the way it hits, this change the transients and stuff. But it's, um, it is hard because, because also you sometimes with those sounds, you, you want, the repetition you want it to be the same sound to an extent because that's what is building up the track it's it's this signature sound and what's the point of a signature sound if it changes every four bars but yeah how to make it just evolve i suppose mm-hmm. is it yeah it's a tricky business and that's when i think yeah as i say, i start to process or i might multi-track the sound so back it up with the same sound but with some weird distortion or effects or a kind of convolution reverb to put in a different kind of space or just find some way of keeping the feet you know keeping the feet keeping the same family but just evolving it moving it on and changing it but yeah it's tricky i suppose well i don't know that's the answer well it's it's (laughs) (laughs) there is really a right answer i mean you kind of said what what i would uh, what i would do myself which what i do what i do do and i do do um which is using effects in 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 the box Mm. processing uh yes but sometimes i mean i i'm very guilty of this myself sometimes i just can't be asked (laughs) (laughs) i was like just repeat it just just slap it in there just there we go that's it uh yeah no that's that's yeah so that's why it's quite nice with some of the uh, uh what are they called boom library are very good at that that they'll give you four kind of one shots that are all more or less the same but they're just slightly different so you can vary it as the track goes on which is well done them for making that extra effort yeah <laughs> well the thing is you know most of those hits are going to be uh layers of about 20 sounds aren't they yeah uh, so just sell the first five the next five the next five the next five then tens and then 15 and then, yeah job yeah done. yeah <laughs> uh yeah so i mean the, the trick i often do is automate your eq so just uh, yes, cutting off the nice. high end and so it's like a at the start and by the by the end it's like <laughs> yeah exactly yes because yes. that's what, one yeah that's what you want you want it at the start you want it to feel subdued and like like the ex- yes. like the explosions Distant. are happening in the distance yeah the, the bombs start coming closer i don't know why everything's always explosions but you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah 
<laughs> yeah, well, that makes sense. So, Sai, I want to talk about feature films. Uh, yes. Because the thing is, although this is about trailer music, uh, we're all interested in getting our music everywhere and anywhere all the time pretty much you know and yeah. as, as trailer composers our music does land still on ads on games on features in tv mm-hmm. because our music is dramatic uh, yeah so uh how did you get into feature film scoring um well the very first one i did i mean i always had was keeping my eye out for any opportunities so i guess the first thing is you put yourself out there you let it be known that you're interested in doing such things and then just luckily, the first one I did, it was honestly one of the most random things ever. It was a guy who used to work for Pioneer, who uh, made CDJs and all that kind of thing. Well, still do. And I did sound design for all of their branding and adverts and stuff online. He was selling his flat and the guy who was buying the flat was a, a film producer. And they got talking about music and they said, we're always looking for good composers and my mate at Pioneer said, oh, you should talk to my mate Cy Berg. He does music. And that got me my first feature film. Insane. Uh, which was actually a ridiculous film that was billed as Independence Day, but in Derby, which was about <laughs> <laughs> about right, and had a Jean-Claude Van Damme in it, which wow. was marvellous. So it was like this crazy kind of sci-fi action thing, but kind of low budget and set in Derby. Never seen, it, never seen anything like it. But it actually had some quite good moments. But it was that that was a hell of a learning curve because they didn't have much money, they didn't have much time, and they were very stressed. But they all the track references were, you know, all of Hans Zimmer's biggest, most bombastic kind of action scores. It's like of course. Okay, yeah. right. Easy. Uh and a lot from Tron at the time. That's when Tron Daft Punk's Tron had just come out, so there was a lot of that. Something epic and amazing like this, right? Okay, yeah, easy. Yeah. Um <laughs> With no budget. But yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and they wanted quite a lot of orchestral stuff. And I hadn't done a huge amount of orchestral stuff. So I had to quickly go out and um, spend huge amounts of money on Spitfire libraries and things like that. Uh, and quickly learn how to do string arrangements, kind of. Uh, but it was a lot of fun. And it, although it was very stressful and compared to I mean, the amount of work that goes into schools, especially when, because in the low budget world, you know, all they haven't got much money, so you're pretty much providing all the music throughout because that's they haven't got any money to license anything else. So it was a huge amount of music, and so compared to yeah, the amount of work that you do compared to trailers is is, is ridiculous. Really, it's it's very yeah. <laughs> I don't know why I bother, but <laughs> uh, but I do because the end result is great because it's lovely to see rather than just a trailer to see a whole scene and then themes and you know oh it's lovely and there's nothing quite like seeing in the cinema and you know hearing your music throughout a film is 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 wonderful and so since then, i mean you know, i i'm still finding my way in that world uh, i've done quite a lot of films where they have been very low budget but i feel like i'm you know edging my way up uh, the latest one that i did this darkness of otherwhere that had a lot of the bespoke stuff i felt it's the first one that's really absolutely played to my strengths the guy came in. I mean, it's a very art house film. It's never going to, you know, it's not going to be a smash hit on Netflix or anything, but it is doing very well on the festival circuit at the moment. What festival circuit there is. Um, and he came to me and he said his favourite, he said he, he he likes the sound of Eraserhead and his and Under the Skin was his favourite. He said that was the main reference. It was like, brilliant. That suits me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm away. So I had, yeah, great time just being in dark and as weird and as interesting as uh as i wanted uh and so yeah hopefully just have to find more that suit what i do rather than me trying to do things again it's like that thing you know there's people that are going to do an orchestral score far better than me so i don't want to do those i'd rather do and the i mean i'm hoping i did a great uh electronic sci-fi horror one a film called peripheral that is on it's on amazon at the moment and that, again, t- the, all the scores they referenced, I loved classic 80s electronic sc- horror scores, John Carpenter and all the rest of it, with a bit of uh, Trent Reznor thrown in. It was like, yes, perfect. This is going to play to my strengths, you know. <laughs> well, so, yes. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, you did a film uh, recently called uh, Madness in the Method. Yes, uh, I did. Which, that's got some big names in it, you know. It has got some big names in it, again. 
quite random. Um, that was actually the same guys that I did the Independence Day in Derby film for, the same producers. Um, and because they knew... Because I have done fun, funny stuff. I, I did this Netflix series called Love Sick that was kind of like a, a kind of a rom-com, I suppose, essentially. Because, um, again, I quite like, although I do a lot of dark horror stuff, I, I do like also just kind of quirky and just interesting, anything interesting. And so for Mance and the Method, they were they wanted stuff that, because some of it is quite dramatic, but a lot of it is just, very silly, very comedic, but they didn't want to go too slapstick. Uh, they still wanted to be kind of cool, so we trying to find some interesting kind of music that, that backs that up. Um, a lot of it quite simple, again, going that less is more thing. Some of it was just literally just drum tracks. We just came up with just nice, well-played kits, doing just nice background sounds and nice grooves and beats, uh, a bit like a, a funky version of some of the, you know, um, what's the film, you know, the, the one-take Birdman how it just had all that drumming throughout. Uh, it was a bit like that, but with more of kind of a breakbeat attitude to it. Um, so, yeah, that was, that was a fun experience. That's what, yes. Yeah. Well, awesome. Uh, see, I also like how you casually just dropped in there scoring a, a TV series. Yes. It's, you know, so uh, you you have your hands in, in many pies. Uh, I do. So uh, how, did you, how, did you get, how did you get into that? That was... Again, a friend of a friend um, who was one of the executive producers and he knew that the director, um, Elliot Hegarty, who's done loads of comedy stuff um, over the years, but they knew he was looking for something a bit electronic. He, he, he was loving, he wanted something that referenced those kind of classic 80s, um, kind of Ferris Bueller's day off kind of era films. So had a kind of an 80s synth pop sensibility Ooh, to yeah. it. So, and my mate knew, oh, Cy does has synthesizers in his house. I've seen them. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> he must know something about that. Uh, so I pitched some ideas and they were like, yeah, yeah, let's do it. So that was, that was, that was, uh, that was a fun one. Because again, they wanted it. It was, it was a, a rom-com, but it's about young, kind of early 20s, post-university guys. And uh, so it had to be cool. They wanted something that was authentic and had a, a cool sound to it and was a bit different. So that's why they wanted this electronic kind of feel and that worked out well in the end so yeah oh, i can't I, I always whenever someone says the word cool i'm always like oh no <laughs> yeah. i can't do cool <laughs> yeah and what's even been it's that thing of you know one man's cool is another man's naff anyway it's like well exactly yeah very hard to pin down things he, like that he says walking around in bermuda shorts yeah <laughs> yeah oh it's like i was just saying to earlier so whether it's that thing of yeah, essentially half time and half the feedback you get is you know things like that. Yeah, we like it. it can make it a bit cooler, or just like we like it, it can make it better. Is this ad- <laughs> can just make it more good. Is this advertising talking about? I think anything yeah. these days. <laughs> can you just do what you've done but better? Yeah, okay. yeah. It needs to be a bit more orange sounding. Yes, Ooh. yes. Epic but understated. That's my favourite one. <laughs> yeah, or well, iconic. It's like, well, I can't make something like iconic things have become iconic. I yeah. can't make it iconic, can I? <laughs> yeah. uh, unless I just re-record Queen. Uh... <laughs> yeah. <gasps> oh, it kills you. Oh, no. So this this is really nice uh, because, obviously, we're chatting. Uh, but it's really nice to hear the fact that diving into the things you enjoy has brought you not just successes, but a varied a life of work Mm, yeah you know because obviously a lot of the trailer composers who i talk to trailer composers you know that's Mm. what that's what we do you know uh, which is great you know uh yeah 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 but it's rather than being like diving into trailer music you've dived into the weird world of sound with yes you know uh, and and its applications and that's really really nice uh really refreshing Yeah, well, that's what I found, and it has kept me, well, it's kept the mortgage paid apart from anything else, but that I don't think there's any single part of what I do that either A, um, yeah, would earn me enough money necessarily, but would also, I think, it's 100% interest me. I, I, I 
like to have different kinds of projects so when i'm bored of doing that kind of thing then i can spend a week doing that kind of thing then i'm bored of that so i can go back to doing the other thing rather than bang your head against one thing i do sometimes worry that i spread myself around a little bit thin the male thing well maybe i should specialize a little bit more which i have tried to a bit more with um uh the styles of stuff i've been doing as i say i've kind of i used to try and do especially in advertising you got into that thing of just trying anything pitching for every single job going even though you knew you know it's like i'm I'm never going to sound like you know a pop band or like a, a really cool jazz band however many sample libraries I, <laughs> I cut together sax solos from or whatever yeah there's people that are gonna be better at this than me so I do find now, yeah, I, I do more of what I feel I'm good at and I play to my strengths and try to avoid, yeah, banging my head against the wall trying to do something, be something I'm not. That's great advice, I think. Yes. So listeners, if you're, if, you're, if you're worried about, you know, the dire- direction you're headed, I would say listen to that advice, uh, play to your strengths, do the things yes. you enjoy. Yeah, oh, and even better, find if you can find something that you can do that maybe other people aren't doing, or haven't thought of doing then even better if there's an instrument that you can play particularly well that you don't hear much of in trailers or scores then do that you know play if you've got a yeah unique talent if the bassoon is your thing when's the last time you had a good bassoon on a trailer yeah you know? well we wouldn't know we've all mangled it so much <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah great so, advice yeah. uh i it, we haven't really covered uh like the struggles the creative barriers that we face so much so apart from like mm. you know un unprecise feedback or the struggle of the third act or yes. the struggle of balancing your sounds i mean what other struggles do you think as a freelance composer and trailer composer that you face um yes i suppose well, the struggles are many and varied, <laughs> endless struggles. Um, I think it is deciding, yeah, where to focus your energies sometimes, uh, where what what's worth, because so much of what you do is quite speculative. Um, and it's like, is it worth me spending two weeks on something that might come to nothing? Um, so, yeah, where to focus, I find, is quite difficult. As I say, I do so many different things. And then I think, yeah, it's finding, I often find with me, especially because the kind of stuff I do is generally about st- stuff that is a bit more new and fresh sounds, more interesting stuff people haven't heard before. But how can you do something that's new, fresh and interesting, but still sounds good and it's going to be useful in a score or in a trailer or in something rather than just being weird noises. There's no point in making weird noises for the sake of weird noises, which is a shame. I wish I could because <laughs> that'd be a very happy career just making weird noises. But there has to be weird noises that work in the given situation, um, which is, yes, try, just trying to find new ways of... Because of, of, often it is we're telling the same stories or we're doing the same emotions that have always been there, like in a trailer let's say about that third act it's still the same feeling that you want that excitement that energy but how can we do it in a new and interesting way that no one's heard before but it still works it still does the job i think that is the the biggest challenge i suppose yeah uh all of those i have suffered from and do (laughs) suffer yeah uh the 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 because that because because i suppose that's the other top things i think to think is there's no point in just repeating what other people have done which is what you hear so much with jobbing composers they hear something they love and they think well i'm just going to do that again it's like but then it's, you're too late because someone's already done that you need to do something new and that's that's what's hard yes i think i i, I don't so much chase the new uh, as much as i used to because i think i've decided a while ago to focus on well if i like it and it's not new necessarily because uh, ultimately the other thing is like I remember as a, a an aspiring composer agonizing over my chord sequence. Yeah, it's got to be a new chord sequence. I'm never going to write a new chord sequence. Just go with one, four, five, six. You know, just grab one and yeah. and roll with it and see what you can do that gets you excited. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, mm. 
let's uh, move on to the quick fire round. Okay. Because uh, otherwise, I feel I feel we're just going to keep talking. So, um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is the this is the thing like I, w- I was like when i first launched this podcast i was like if i do interviews because you know they're quite hard to arrange and everything i'm gonna make sure they're 30 30 minutes long and it's just gonna be like boom 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 <laughs> and then you start talking and you're like oh i find all this interesting so it yeah, turns, it turns yes, into yes. a conversation <laughs> yes yes uh right sorry oh. yeah quick fire round uh okay uh, okay right so just some uh quick questions it's it's about technical stuff, okay. Um, because we uh, all us trailer composers love to hear about the gear that everyone else is using. See, I'm not going on yes. outboard gear. I mean, I I don't use any outboard gear except for a MIDI keyboard and some mics and things. Uh, yeah. So I've never really been enamoured. But sample okay. sample libraries and plugins. Mm-hmm. Hello. Okay. Yes. So, um, Sai, what is your Door of choice, your DAW. Oh, oh, that kind of door. I thought this was going to be an option of different yeah, doors. I, the red door, the blue door. I like, logic. I'm, yeah. a, I'm, a, I'm a logic head. Yes, Fab. absolutely. High five. I use Pro Tools if I have to. Like if someone gives me... Uh, sometimes when I've done... So I have also, as well as doing film music, I have sometimes done film sound design as well. So sometimes you get these horrible, massive... Um, AFF files and things like that that you have to open in Pro Tools, but I hate Pro Tools. I love Logic. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, go to piano library. Uh, well, it would depend on what kind of piano I want, but I think generally, um, I love. I do like the Native Instruments Una Corda. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, which is not. I mean, is that strictly piano? Does that count more or less? Um, I love. The old, I still go back to the Spitfire. I mean, I don't know what they call it now. It was the Labs felt piano. It's just lovely, soft piano. It's called soft piano now. It is called soft piano. That's right. And there's also a new one I came across that was an Italian sample library. I think it's just called My Piano. But it's oh. an Italian, it- uh, again, very nice cinematic soft piano. Can't remember the name of the company now. Oh, uh, not felt. They were- is it felt? No. Uh- no. Yes, I know it. the piano. Uh, yeah, they were doing a good deal on it, I remember, and that's how I found it. <laughs> so this is the nice thing. Whenever I've asked these questions, I've very, apart from the DAW, I've very rarely got one answer. <laughs> because, <laughs> because as you rightly say, it depends what you're yes. doing. But generally, if I was to reach for a piano, I'd be, it would either be Alicia's Keys or Spitfire's yes. Felt Piano. Yes. Um, the same one, the, the initial yes, Labs yeah, one, yeah, yeah. which was donation web. Uh, go yeah. to String Library. Um, again, it depends what kind of strings you want, but I like, um, I do love my, uh, the Spitfire, um, what do they call it? The LCO, the London Contemporary Orchestra oh, yes. Library yeah. for interesting, still very, you know, still strings, but they're just interesting strings full of character. Um, but they're not very hard hitting, but for just lovely, interesting atmospheric stuff absolutely yes i love those because they've got like uh dug in sample like <clears throat> yeah really yeah gritty yeah That's a good and then one. Uh, actually for and then for individual kind of solo stuff i do like the 8do ones there's they have a nice i can't remember what they call it now but it's called something like solo bass and solo violin are very nice and they have a nice phrase library as well some nice phrases if you want some nice things like that but yes nice but Go to yeah. go to brass library. Uh, probably again, it would be Spitfire, but maybe the I can't remember which one of the Albions. I can't remember which one it is now. Maybe the Neo. I think has some very nice brass. Um, some really nice gnarly trumpets. In fact, I still also go back to one of the first ones I ever got, which is Symphobia, the Project Sam Symphobia. Oh, that's because that's, that's some amazing. really fat, gnarly, just good old, yeah, nice trombone ensembles and stuff. I remember when I got my first crack copy of Symphobia. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and it was one of those moments when I'd been just using uh, Reason. Uh, yes. So nothing really orchestral. And if it was, it still sounded like a keyboard. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So I loaded up Symphobia and I was like, oh, yeah, it's an amazing. actual orchestra. 
So, yeah, yeah, cool. yeah. Uh, okay, go to percussion. So for this, we, we you can split this into two types of percussion. Mm-hmm. Uh, sort of close, small, intimate percussion and mm-hmm. big trailer style percussion. And there's so many different ones I end up using. I have been very impressed with the new, with Damage 2, I have to say. Uh-huh. Uh, for just nice big fat taikos and all the rest of it, the classic stuff. I often have enjoyed, there's a sample logic one. Oh, what's it called? Drum. Going to have to have a look now. <laughs> Thun- what's it called? Thunder. No, not thunder drums. Oh, it's taken a while to come up. I haven't, I have haven't, it, I haven't yet gone to damage two. Uh, I've, I've still in drum it. fury. Drum That's fury. it. Drum Thank fury you. sample logic uh, again for big drums. Although they're quite nice, close might not as big as not totally over the top trailer stuff, but more like individual tycos, individual bass drums, that kind of thing. Um, beyond that, what else do I use? So many different. There's one I particularly enjoying for the horror stuff recently. Um, I think it's Red Room Audio. Do a really nice Bodron. Is that oh. that's how you pronounce it? The yeah. Irish yeah. drum. Yeah. Great library of that. It's just lovely, dry, very kind of witchy, folky, well recorded. Uh-huh. Hand and beaters and brushes, different kinds of hits. Really nicely recorded. That's very good. In fact, they've got a good loop library as well. I can't remember what it's called. Something like. Um, oh, I don't know. It's quite generic sounding title, but it's just lots of great ethnic kind of loops and stuff that's very good. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, this one I appreciate. Oh, I, yeah. I think you've kind of already answered this, but go to synth. Ah, go to synth. Many and varied, again, depending what I'm doing. I do love serum if I want some fat nastiness. I do go <laughs> serum a lot. I do very much also enjoy the UV Falcon, uh-huh. which is quite nice. Not, not everyone's cup of tea, but I do like the Falcon. Um, and then, yeah, I do like my old analogs as well pro one <laughs> there, there um, you are sorry <laughs> yeah uh but yeah i use loads of different synths uh soft synths all yeah. sorts of different things but quite often you know they'll be they might do one thing really well but not be good at anything else but for good all as far as all rounders go that i keep coming back to i think serum and falcon are probably the two that i come back to the most nice i've uh, i i have i've dabbled a little in in the synth world so uh Mm. serum does come up a lot yeah yeah uh okay so top three effects plugins now oh I, well, sorry and actually oh. i have to say it would be a reactor as well actually if that counts oh, yes. as a synth but there's so many yeah. different interesting little mini synths for that love yeah. reactor yeah uh okay yeah this one's a difficult one but you're gonna have to be brutal top three effects plugins <sighs> top three effects plugins well in terms if i just go with the ones that i use the most yep um it would probably be the valhalla one of the valhalla reverbs probably the valhalla vintage verb i do use that an awful lot i used to use valhalla shimmer all the time but i've kind of switched now to valhalla vintage verb a bit more um i mean it's boring but i suppose in terms of use i do use isotope ozone on pretty much everything i do for mastering mastering it yeah and sometimes some of the individual elements on channel strip type stuff as well, compressing and the EQs. Um, and what would be the third? Well, look, I can look at my most recent. What have I got in here? Ah, yes. Well, that's one I've had a lot of fun lately with this portal. What's it called? The granular thing. Ah. Uh, Oh, it's called Portal. That's right. Output. Output's Portal plugin, which is a brilliant. It can do reverbs and delays and flanges, of course, but it's lots of crazy granular stuff and loads of great modulation options, which I found is a really fun way of taking processing organic stuff. So it doesn't always sound super electronic. It can. It, it's weird, time stretchy kind of, don't know. Yeah, interesting. Awesome. Well, you do keep yeah. coming back to wanting interesting sounds and unique I sounds. Do. So there you go. That makes sense. Um, and what is your number one piece of advice to write better trailer music? Oh, number one piece of advice. I would say 
um, yes, I, sp- I, I think I would come back to follow, following your own instinct on what sounds good rather than worrying too much about what you've heard other people do and just try and come up with something that you haven't heard before that but, but that is good <laughs> I don't know trying because I think the, the half the battle is something that stands out somehow that's a bit different to what else is out there so I'd say try and do something a little bit different to what's already out there that would be my advice because nice. everything's been so many things have been done, especially because by the time you hear a trailer, that track's probably been out for a year and was recorded ages ago or maybe even longer. So things move quite quickly. So you need to kind of, yeah, think about what releases are going to be coming out in six months time. That's what my release will be coming out in six months time, probably. So you've got to be ahead, ahead of the game. <laughs> try and get ahead of the game, kids. <laughs> I don't know what that means. Yeah, but, you know. yeah, it's it's one of those things everyone says, though, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Keep keep ahead of the game, guys. Uh... <laughs> and I suppose that's why sometimes I look at what film scores are doing really well and that people are excited about because then that trickles filters down. down to the trailer world. I mean, although sometimes I think it can happen the other way around. Sometimes, sometimes trailers can make a difference to what film composers are doing. You know, so who knows? Yeah, you can. Uh, there's. Uh that very famous trailer track from the inception trailer which yeah. which was the one that kind of introduced the world to Brahms. Brahm, yeah you can yeah. hear that that i think it was in the transformers film there was yeah it was it was the reference track obviously and yeah. the composer had to do uh you know as yeah. close to <laughs> yeah without getting a suit yeah, yeah yeah uh right but sorry uh i think it's about time both of us uh Called a called a day on this, but uh, thank you See. so much for oh, taking no the time to chat to me in the audience. Uh, uh, you know, I, it, sounds, yeah. it sounds so funny saying that because they're obviously not listening right now. <laughs> There's no one here, although they are listening right now. Ah! <laughs> My mind is melting. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So thank you so much, dude. I really appreciate. It. I loved hearing about how you do your work because you know, big fan no of especially all the weirder stuff you do. Big fan of that. Yes. Um, oh, thank you very much. And also that track you got on the IBM ads ages ago. Uh, oh yeah, you know that that's just been put on another IBM ad. Vic said just the other week. Get it. They wanted the same one all over again. <laughs> well, easy, it's been, that was like ten years ago, was it? 10, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Two thousand crazy. Two thousand twelve. So eight years. So yeah. Yeah. There you go. It's been oh. it's been long enough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, dude. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Right there you go. I hope you enjoyed that interview as much as I did. Uh, it was awesome and insightful, and uh, yeah, I, I, it, it did make me want to go out and find a chest of drawers on the street and turn it into a draw zither or something bizarre. Uh, now, as per usual, I just want to say thank you very much for listening. You guys are absolute legends. If you want to take your trailer music further or even want to understand it in more detail, uh, you know, what it takes to make stra- trailer music, trailer music, what it takes to make trailer music, you know, the structures, the bills, the instruments, the tools that we use, then head on over to the Trailer Music School where I've got courses for you. Uh, and of course, if you want to take your music career to the next level, this is beyond trailers, this is into the business, this is into getting your stuff out there and getting mentorship from myself and Vikram, uh, Vikram Gurdy that is from Elephant Music, then head on over to protege.school and uh, Sign up for next year's waiting list. It's going to be an awesome year. See ya!